to Dear Shredder, an advice podcast on shredding and mental health. A quick note, Dear Shredder is presented by Swell Season and is recorded by the Newsstand Studio and Rockefeller Center in the heart of Manhattan. It is distributed by Wax.Radio. You can follow us on Instagram at Dear Shredder, where there's an anonymous form you can use to submit your questions to your host, me, Matt Rohr, psychotherapist in New York City, uh, a.k.a. Shredder. Um, A quick disclaimer for our listeners, listening to this podcast does not constitute therapy or mental health care. If you or someone you know are having a mental health emergency, dial 911, go to an emergency room, contact a licensed mental health care professional, and we'll list a couple of resources for you at the end of the podcast. All right, so I'm really excited to have Jimmy O'Brien, the real J-O-B, on our show today. Um, Jimmy and I met a couple of years ago in the water. Um, We we were just talking before the show, and, and realized that we actually competed against each other in the body surfing contest at Rockaway. Uh, though we, I don't think we exchanged words. We were too fierce of competitors. Um, but we met, met a couple years after that in, in the water at Rockaway, and we were trading notes on some uh, homemade hand-shaped boards that we were riding. I was on a chunky fish uh, with some keels that I made from an old broken skateboard deck. And Jimmy, I believe, was on a mini Simmons with super foiled rails. Um, I think it was the first board he ever shaped. Um, Jimmy and I struck up a conversation. We've gone mat surfing together a couple of times. And I ended up interviewing Jimmy for the publication Primitive Skills about his experience as a shaper working in uh, he and his partner's basement in the Rockaways in New York City. Um, What I did not know about Jimmy at the time was that he had a whole other life um, as a substance abuse counselor in a sober living facility. Um, Jimmy's also, I just also want to mention that Jimmy in recent years has taken his shaping bay from his basement, uh, he and his wife's basement to a a shipping container on the Marina overlooking Jamaica Bay uh, where he shapes boards under the label Poem Surfcraft. Um, I'm super excited to have Jimmy on to talk about his shaping life, to hear his story about addiction, recovery, service, and surfing. Welcome, Jimmy O'Brien. Thanks for being here. Thanks, man. Glad to be here. Yeah. Um, so I want to just, uh, I want you to just start off by talking about how you fell in love with surfing. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't grow up on the coast. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Um, we, my family would, would spend the summers on the coast though. Um, and I guess I started how most people start surfing, just, just body surfing, um, playing in the waves. Uh, I started skimboarding maybe when I was like 12 or 13. And then, um, I saw, I would see people surfing and, um, it was probably about 14 or 15, uh, I, I wanted to try it. I, uh, I, I kind of put the, the cart before the horse and, and like subscribe to every surfer magazine and, and trans world surf and everything like that before I even touched a board. I was just, mm-hmm. I was just sold on it before I'd even surfed. Um, and I, I did that in my, uh, so I started surfing in my, in my teens, uh, and that was on the, the coast of Delaware, in Maryland. And, um, I moved up to New England in my, uh, late teens and stayed up there through my twenties. And I would surf in New Hampshire and Maine when I got chances to do that. Um, and, um, I, I started to get away from surfing a little bit by that time. Um, partially because of geography, I was going to school in Vermont. Uh, and then also just because my priorities had changed. Uh, and I was starting to party quite a bit, uh, mm-hmm. drinking a lot and using drugs, uh, increasingly heavily. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, by the time I was 25, uh, that was the last time I'd surf for, for a number of years. Uh, I think I, there was a, probably a seven or eight year gap where I, I don't think I even went in the ocean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From when you were 25 on into your, into your thirties? Into my thirties. Yeah. And yeah. then, uh, by then I was, I was living in New York city. Uh, I was living in, in Manhattan and Brooklyn. And, um, I, I went on a trip up into, uh, Martha's Vineyard and, 
uh, I had this experience in the ocean where I, I just kind of remembered how good it felt. Um, and, uh, I thought, you know, I, I have to, I have to reconnect here. Uh, there's something that I've been missing in my life. And, um, I, uh, I started surfing in Rockaway and traveling, uh, there more and more often, um, uh, to the point where, you know, I'd, I'd wake up at like four thirty in the morning and, uh, go you know, take the trains out to, out to Rockaway surf for like 45 minutes and then come into the city for like an hour and a half, you know, an hour and a half train ride and in the city, uh, a good stress, so a good stress session. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I gotta get three waves. Yeah, I gotta yeah. get three waves in the next like twenty minutes, and then yeah. I gotta go to work and show up, you know, covered in sand with water dripping out of your nose, and a giant backpack full of wet neoprene, and everybody loves you on the train with your surfboard <laughs> at nine a.m. <laughs> what were you doing for work at that time? Uh, so I was working as a uh, I was I was working for a sober living uh, as a counselor. Uh, I also um, I also just took care of the properties as well. Um, pretty handy in general. So, uh, I would do that as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you came to do that work? Um, yeah. Yeah. How did you get, how did you, how did you get involved in doing that kind of work? So first I, um, I got sober when I was 29. Uh, and I, uh, I went into treatment uh, I went to rehab. I stayed there for, uh, I went there for a month. The initial stay was 28 days. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was what my insurance covered. And, and they said at the end of the 28 days, you're, you know, you're good to go. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, you know, really? Like, I don't, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm ready. And, and so I, I ended up staying for an extra three months in an extended program and uh and then moving into sober living basically a a halfway house in manhattan after that and um it was a really good transitional experience uh that felt safe uh but also allowed me to uh get back into the working world get plugged into recovery community uh establish a peer group and um I did that. I lived in that, in that sober living for about three months before moving into an apartment with a couple of guys who I'd met there. And then, you know, basically just transitioning to, into the the life that I have now. Um, You getting sober really did coincide with you kind of rediscovering um, surfing. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. There there was a little gap there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I was probably, three or four years sober when I started surfing again. Um, but I wasn't necessarily happy. Uh, I had friends, I had things that I was, I was getting into. Um, but they're just, they're just, it just felt like something wasn't, uh, wasn't complete. And, um, ultimately what it came down to was, was being of service. Um, and, um, staying connected, uh, to the recovery world, uh, in some kind of meaningful way, uh, beyond just, beyond just not drinking and using drugs. Um, uh, I, I got sober, uh, through the 12 steps and, um, a big part of that was service. And, um, I, 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 I just thought that, uh, working with people, uh, who were in a position that I was in, uh, not that long ago, uh, would be a, a meaningful way to, uh, to do that. Can you talk about what you mean when you use the term recovery community, um, and what, and sort of the importance of that? Yeah. Um, so I, I personally got sober through AA, which is very much, uh, uh, about having, uh, the group. Um, and, uh, I, I think that, you know, there, there's more than there's, there are plenty of ways to get sober. I, I, I you know, um, I don't think that, uh, the 12 steps is, is the only way. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, it's, it's what worked for me, but, uh, they put, uh, that, that was a, that was a big thing was, was just, uh, at, make sober friends, have, have a group belong to something bigger than yourself. 
Uh, and, and I've found that uh, having that human interaction and that shared experience uh, and that shared struggle is, mm-hmm. is a really important thing. Uh, I, I don't think I could have done this in a vacuum. Uh, I, I've tried. I, I tried. I tried getting sober. I tried staying sober um, on my own. And I had very limited success. So you find that that being a part of a community that is dealing with a similar issue helps to hold you accountable or helps to have uh, people that you relate to? Yeah, the the accountability, uh, the shared language, too, um, uh, and and the shared experience, uh, being able to to relate. Um, I've found that... uh, my recovery community has a has sometimes a pretty dark sense of humor just mm-hmm. because there's uh we've gone to some pretty dark places and uh that laughter and levity uh it, it does a lot for me that's really good medicine mm-hmm. um and just knowing that I'm not alone um i think the darkest time of my life um and we can talk about that more uh, in a bit. But the, the darkest time of my life was was just the um, this feeling of being just basically out in the woods, um, just being being out there alone, um, and it was terrifying. Um, just feeling like a like a ghost mm-hmm. uh, instead of feeling like this this living, breathing. Uh, human being sharing this this beautiful experience in his life with with other people um belonging to something is is something that i think most people yearn for yeah. and um i i personally feel really lucky that i got tapped into uh, a a community uh through recovery as i i think everyone wants a community um and recovery was was my my it was and still is my my primary community it's it's the most important one Mm -hmm. yeah um do you want to talk a little bit about what um i guess when when did you know that you needed you needed a recovery community when did you know that that it wasn't um that you wanted to get help that you weren't you know you need that you needed the help you need the help of others i ran into a lot of trouble really early on um, and I was very quick, uh, early on to just blame it on other things. Um, uh, I had too much to drink. Uh, maybe, maybe I just didn't, you know, maybe I, maybe it was just, uh, something I ate. Maybe it's just the, the, dr- the particular drugs I'm taking. Maybe it's, I was just looking for all kinds of external excuses. Uh, and, uh, one, it, once I'd run out of those excuses, was when I began to to it was only then that I began to question maybe uh maybe the problem is more internal here mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. uh and um that was I I guess uh I guess I just it was one of those willfully blind things where I didn't want to look at that for a long time um the idea that I might be an alcoholic uh, when I was 20 years old was terrifying. Um, because, um, it was a pretty normal, I, I felt like a pretty normal, you know, teenager and 20 year old. I, um, you know, alcoholics were like the, the bums, you know, covered in, you know, covered in their own urine on the street. Um, not, not me, you know, I, I, I had a college degree, I had a job, um, and uh, when that when that sort of internal question came up, you know, am I am I an alcoholic? Mm-hmm. Am I a drug addict? Mm-hmm. Uh, that was really scary. Um, and I tried to tough that out just by just by being abstinent. And I had pretty limited success with that. Uh, and and when I was successfully abstinent, I was not happy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was miserable. I was better off 